Hi there, I'm John of John's Carnivorous Plants and this is my indoor nursery. Today, I'm gonna to teach you how to grow Cephalotus follicularis, a Australian pitcher plant. These guys kind of have a reputation for being a little finicky. And in this video grow guide, I hope to set some of the record straight and teach you everything you need to know to grow one in your own home. Please check out the description to all of the, for the timestamps of all the different sections of this video, as well as links to my social media, including my Discord, where 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, every Thursday, I do a live Q&A from the nursery here. I also check it about twice a day and answer any questions that might pop up in what I hope is a timely manner. There's also a link in the description to my nursery where you can buy one of these beautiful plants for me directly. I hope you like and subscribe and enjoy the video. And thank you so much for watching. The first and most important point to cultivating any carnivorous plant is climate. You need to provide a stable climate for long-term success. This includes temperature, humidity, and airflow. To maintain a stable climate of 40 to 80% humidity, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and steady airflow, I suggest the following. Use a humidifier near your grow area to maintain humidity. Bags, clear plastic cups, and humidity domes work, but these options are a poor replacement for ambient humidity. Bags and plastic cups in particular can amplify the sun and roast plants with high sun exposure if grown on a windowsill. Use a space heater or air conditioner to keep your temperature between 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Going too far out of this temperature range can cause stress to the immune systems of the plants and lead to more fungal and pest infections. To measure your grow area's climate, I highly recommend purchasing a thermometer or humidity gauge like this one. There's a link in the description to buy one from Amazon. The next important point to cultivating carnivorous plants is lighting. The sun is the best light you can have for your plants. Since most homes do not have windowsills that provide enough light, indoor growers are left to using indoor LED grow lights. Here you can see that I use an array of different fixtures. No matter what kind of lights you use, make sure to drape the cords before going to your outlet to prevent water-related electrical fires. An appropriately rated timer for your lights is critical to the long-term health of your plants. As a quick overview, lighting sources should be four to six inches away from most species of carnivorous plants. I recommend Yescom 225 lights as they cost around $30 off Amazon and work great for smaller collections. You can use four foot LED shop lights from most big box stores as well. I have a link in the description to the red blue sun coat lights that I use for some of my racks. Make sure that you provide at least 12 hours of direct light to your plants a day. Going under this amount can stress certain tropical plants. Like climate shifts, this can lead to decreased immune function. Even plants like to sleep and some like Biblis only digest prey at night. As a safety tip, make sure you drape your cords and have a low spot to prevent water related electrical fires. If you're growing your plants outside or on a window, use the species specific lighting preference later in this video as a guide to how much exposure the plant should receive. Next up, soil. Most carnivorous plants occur in nutrient poor soils. I grow all of mine in either a mix of peat and perlite or straight long fiber sphagnum moss. Always make sure your medium is thoroughly wet and mixed if the medium is dry, the plants will die. Never use any medium with fertilizers. The nutrients will burn most carnivorous plant species roots. Always make sure you rinse your peat and perlite before use. And lastly, if you do not want to make your own mix, I sell pre-made carnivorous plant medium packs on my website. There's a link in the description. One of the most common questions I see is how do I mix my medium? First I use peat, then I add perlite, I use a hoe and mix it all thoroughly together. I then take my pots, fill it thoroughly to the top, and give it a slight pat down. Always make sure to thoroughly top water your pots. And as you can see here in this last scene, there's the difference between wet and dry peat. Next up, water. First thing you need is a TDS meter like this. It'll measure the total dissolved solids in your water. You need water with under 100 parts per million of total dissolved solids for carnivorous plants. Here you can see my tap water comes in at around 100 parts per million. Next, my reverse osmosis filtered water clocks in at 12 parts per million. To water, I use the tray method, watering from the bottom of the pot. I fill these trays one to two inches up the pot and refill the trays once the tray is dry, but before the medium dries.
For a quick overview, make sure to have a TDS meter and only use water under 100 parts per million of total dissolved solids. Tap water is usually unusable, so make sure to test it before use. Distilled water from a grocery store, pharmacy, or other store will work. Nursery water will also work. Water from an air conditioner or dehumidifier can be used, but is not recommended for the long term. Use the tray method of watering. Make sure the water is at least one inch from the bottom of the pot. If the soil dries, the plant dies. Top water all plants except pingwicula and some small rosetta drosera every two months to prevent mineral buildup, promote oxygen exchange, and prevent most fungal growth. Lastly, to fertilize or feed carnivorous plants, I use Maxi 161616 fertilizer and apply it as a foliar feed. You can mix a small amount with water and use an eyedropper or pipette, but I prefer to use a missing bottle. I'll take small amounts on a plant tag and shake vigorously to mix. To be accurate, the mixture clocks in around 100 parts per million. I miss the plant's foliage thoroughly for about 30 minutes before the lights go off every two weeks. Make sure to spray at an angle perpendicular to the pot to prevent excess fertilizer. This can cause algae growth that can be easily scraped away. Utricularia can be fed by spraying the topsoil, but back off if you see algae mats forming. Cephalotus folliculares is a beautiful and stunning plant looks like little moccasins and people go absolutely crazy every time they see these beautiful beautiful things growing in my nursery literally my brother first time uh he saw the plant that you see in the picture here he was just like oh my goodness what why didn't you tell me you grew plants as cool as this at which point i felt kind of offended for the rainbow plants <laughs> Cephalotus have a reputation for being very difficult to maintain in cultivation, but that difficulty doesn't come from what care parameters it needs. 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 70% humidity, about 12 to 13 hours of on light time from your lights, but I keep mine at 14 usually. And they respond good to either white or red blue or blue is what I found in my experiences where all of your problems will come in with cephalotis is the fact that this plant in the wild is always found in areas where it is constantly always wet so it's like it'll be to be in a stream or a bog or something but there is like some kind of movement to the water allowing it to be oxygenated so cephalotis like water with high oxygenation meaning they do not like the traditional tray method that most people utilize. This is why I highly suggest top water all your cephalotis and let the tray underneath it dry out in between waterings. This is why I suspect some people who do cephalotis in trays have good success is because they're probably a little bit more neglectful than they'll let on and they don't keep the tray entirely wet all the time. Because every time I've tried to do that, I have always rotted my cephalotis. Ever since I switched over to top watering though, I haven't rotted a single ceph. So, I mean, that's now going on two and a half years at the time of this recording. So, just saying, it's it looks like it's working for me so far. So, I definitely have to suggest that as a good method, especially if you've ever tried the tray method and killed the cephalotis before. If it's your first time, just start with the top watering. I know that will work for you. Thank you for watching this far. I have links in the description to other great reference videos done by other nursery owners for the International Carnivorous Plant Society. These include a pesticide discussion from Damon of California Carnivores and a lighting presentation from Drew of Carnivoro. There's also a link to Barry Rice's Carnivorous Plant FAQ, which has been invaluable to my own learning. Once again, if you want to try growing carnivorous plants or expand your collection, check out my website. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more carnivorous plant content. I wish you happy growing and great success. Thanks again.